Hello, hello, and welcome to Art Pop Talk. I'm Bianca. And I'm Gianna. Well, Gianna, happy Women's History Month. I know we talk about ladies a lot on this show, but now that we're in March, it really makes much more of a statement, don't you think? I couldn't agree more. You know I think that we should only talk about women in the month of March. (laughs) Right, totally. Well, given that we are in extra special lady month, we're going to do what we do best and talk about all of the gals celebrating International Women's Day. We're going to talk about some of our favorite women of art history. All right, let's get started. Hey, lady. What's the tea? What's the hot goss this week? Got anything new for me since I talked to you yesterday? No, I really don't. I'm sorry. Um, Not much is going on. It's just, you know, pot all night, work all day, and I'll get to see you in a week. And that's what we'll celebrate. Oh my gosh, I am so excited. This past week has truly flown by and I really hope that this next week just moves even quicker. I'm so looking forward to spring break. If the art pop tarts don't know, which I don't know that we've talked about it too much, I am so excited to be able to drive home for spring break. So it's going to be really exciting. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's all you got for me. That's all you got for me today. Yeah. (laughs) Cool. I like it. I like it. Well, on that note, I mean, should we just jump right in and go to some art news? Oh, you know I love some good art news. Let's do it. (laughs) All right. Well, today's art news is about a new app that's turning everyone into Polaroid photographers without having to go to an Urban Outfitters to buy, you know, that $100 camera that's like pink and comes in a really cute case. I came across this new app called Dispo in a Facebook group that I'm in. And the caption was something along the lines of like, if anyone was on Dispo and wanted to do like a follow train in this Facebook group I'm in. And I was like, oh my gosh, man, like this is another app that APT is gonna have to get on and post in and (laughs) we're gonna have to manage this thing. But when I downloaded the app, I had to join a wait list and I was just very confused about what Dispo was. So essentially the app launched on February 19th in beta testing and it became the fourth most downloaded app in the app store. And because of that, it generated a ton of investor interest. This app now exceeds $20 million in investment and is valued at $200 million. So like, what the hell? Where are all these like investors coming from? We need one for <laughs> APT stat. <laughs> <laughs> so this app is intended to act as a disposable camera and it allows you to take these kind of Polaroid-esque photos that aren't even immediately available but can be viewed the following day. There are no edits, no filters, and there are no captions, but people can like and they can comment on your roles, which are kind of, as I understand it, basically your feed of images. In a New York Times interview, David Dobrik, interessant, who is the creator of Dispo, explained that he purposefully limited the options. So... The purpose is to bring the user closer to the experience of using a disposable camera, like the ones of your cameras of your. So, Chiana, I'm wondering, what do we think about Dispo? You're cracking up. This reminds me of like the Gen Z kids who are now buying Razer phones because they're vintage. I can't with the Razer phones, like. Please stop buying razor phones. I want a razor phone because I never had a pink razor when they were like cool. And like they're still cool, but isn't there a new razor? Yes, phone? no. Motorola Motorola. Motorola. <laughs> Motorola is making a razor phone with a touch screen that bends in half. It's really interesting, but uh-huh. people are buying the actual old razor phones because right. of the 
aesthetic of them and people are buying like burner phones and bedazzling them and like only texting their like bff with them which is so cute like i love that journey for you but also just buy a disposable camera <laughs> i don't know oh, okay i think it's an interesting idea for me it's just another thing to keep up with on the mm -hmm. internet which we all know how i feel about that <laughs> i don't know but i Something the other day actually happened that was very interesting to me because mm. I have heard for a while that Instagram has been thinking about limiting its feature. Oh, right. To, I forgot you told me this. Yeah, to see and uh, limit how many likes a photo gets. And the other day I was logging onto my Instagram and my likes went away on my mm -hmm. feed and on my page as well. So... I was like, oh my gosh, it's happening, because uh, I know that they have started doing that in other countries, but since I have like four other Instagram accounts for Art Pop Talk and mm -hmm, for my personal, right. and I do social media for our other sister as well, all of that was popping up on these other accounts. It was just mine. And so I had limited access to seeing how many likes I had for about like three days, and now mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's back interesting it is very interesting so i don't really know what to make of that i don't know but i think just in talking about kind of the limited features on dispo mm -hmm. i mean that has just been something instagram has been talking for talking about for a while so yeah i think it was only a matter of time another app kind of came into play that was just about the mm -hmm. photo experience mm -hmm. um yeah so i don't know it's definitely interesting i i do think a lot of people are using it and are going to continue to use it mm -hmm. um but i think like any social media app i am always late to the trend and it will mm -hmm. take me a very long time to ease up into downloading a new social media feature yeah i like that i think it's i think first of all i would be totally okay with instagram taking away the a capability to see the number of likes on other people's profiles so it's my understanding that on instagram you yourself can see how many people liked your photo but you can't see it anywhere else and no one else can see how many likes you receive and i think dispo seems kind of cool i think that I really like the premise of it that it's kind of art for art's sake and just kind of sharing like almost what you would on your Instagram story like it's not mm -hmm. it, it's not always super catered unless you're like an in influencer or something like that mm -hmm. but I will say that I I did start a dispo account for APT and I think it would be really cool to kind of just post snapshots on what we're doing like kind of art unexpectedly that we encounter in our everyday lives I think it's an interesting way to kind of curate either purposely or very spontaneously a yeah. series of photos yeah but i'm on a wait list so we'll we'll keep you guys posted when we're on a wait list for it yeah because they're in beta testing still so it's uh, not fully functioning so only some people were able to join dispo right away interesting but i did start us an account <laughs> hmm. <laughs> another thing to look forward camera. to <laughs> You have one. You could use your real disposable camera from Urban Outfitters, and I could use Dispo. Yeah, but a disposable camera is different from a Polaroid. Oh, I see what you mean. You have a Polaroid camera. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. Like, do you I... remember the days of, do you, like, Bianca, do you remember, like, when you got your camera and you got a waterproof camera, and I, I got was a so jealous, camera. and it was, like, yeah. this whole big thing that you got a camera yeah definitely no i and, like we that have camera. some really green <laughs> yes it was green like we have some really good cringy like middle school photos of you being hot shit oh, with your lime sure. green waterproof camera <laughs> oh yeah those were, those the, were days. the days <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i think that i'm a person that still really enjoys printing out photos though mm -hmm. so i use the app free prints and I just send photos from my phone to free prints mm -hmm. using their app and I get them shipped to my house. Mm -hmm. And I still really like that. I still really like the feeling of going through physical photos. Well, I remember getting like waterproof disposable cameras. 
Oh like, yeah. I, I am here for the actual disposable camera. And like a lot of people are getting back into using film and Yeah. So I I guess it's just like a natural progression of social media like in talking about it it all makes sense. But uh-huh. well, I think I, I don't it's know. also the same thing that's happened with music for example, you know, the return to vinyl and the return to kind of Yeah tapes and things like that yeah so i'm not surprised that this occurrence is taking place with your cell phone in a weird way but different way i mean it's obviously different i'm getting like vine vibes like i I don't know how long it's gonna last oh interesting yeah i guess we'll find out yeah dun 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 (laughs) (laughs) all righty friends today's art pop talk is all about celebrating International Women's Day, which was March 8th, but you got the whole month of March to listen to this episode before it doesn't count anymore. (laughs) So Gianna and I are each going to talk about a few of our favorite ladies of the arts, but before we do, Gianna, I want to know if you could go to a Judy Chicago-inspired type of dinner party and you've had to invite five ladies, dead or alive, that we have not talked about on the show before, who would they be? Because as much as I love her, I just feel like we can't keep giving Gaga the unfair advantage here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, she already has a seat at the table. Truly. Um, So, yes, definitely have a couple. I would say Natalie Baxter. She is this textile artist and sculptor, and she has this bloated flag series that really got me through the dark days of 2016 to 2020. And then I would have to say Linda Banglis because That's a she's good one. a bad bitch who placed a photo of herself with a dildo in a paper and it was very gender performative and I don't know. I just am obsessed with her, but more importantly, I am obsessed with her sculptures. Yes, I love the drip works. Drip works so are good. great. They're everything about her sculptures are just like so spontaneous and Mm -hmm. like sexual at the same time i don't know how to describe (laughs) it it's it's like is it possible to be sexually attracted to an object yes 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 Yes, it it is is. (laughs) um and then i would have to say rebecca belmore she is a mixed media and performance artist the agency of the female body in her work is very politically and socially conscious, but the use of her body in her performative work is also so laborious and ritualistic. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, it reminds me of Abramovich's work in putting Mm -hmm. the body through extreme scenarios, but she just speaks to abuse and discrepancies that predominantly Indigenous women are afflicted by. Mm -hmm. And then I would also have to say Zoe Buckman, that might be a little bit of a cheat because I can't remember if I have talked about her or not <laughs> because I do I, have a tendency to talk about her quite a bit. I feel I feel like we may have just briefly mentioned her, but I'll, I'll let it slide because yeah. she's fantastic. Yeah, she just is a huge inspiration to me and in just talking about the consumer world from a female perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and then last but certainly not least, Edmonia Lewis shattering race and gender expectations for artists and particularly sculptors. Mm -hmm. Lewis's work can be attributed to the neoclassical style where biblical, literary, and classical subjects were popular, but she showed these icons or characters in a different light that was much more truthful and less idealized. For example, there's a piece of hers that I really love, and it's a sculpture of Cleopatra shown the moment after she committed suicide Mm -hmm. instead of that moment of contemplating if she wants to take her own life, which Mm -hmm. was the more traditional way of telling that Mm. story. Yeah, Edmonia Lewis, that's a really good one. Okay, what about you? Okay, so... I think I have to go with Amelia Jones. She is a feminist art historian that I admire a lot. I've studied a lot of her writings and relied on so many of her books when I was doing my own research. And part of the reason that we have feminist art history and feminist art historical context and exhibitions and 
discussions is because of Amelia Jones. So I really admire her a lot. Um, I think Simone de Beauvoir. I mean, I have to have my French girl in there. <laughs> I think number three would be Queen Nefertiti. Gianna, I almost went with Cleopatra because I have, I do have like a little obsession with Cleopatra. But Queen Nefertiti, I think the bust of Nefertiti is just one of my favorite art historical objects ever. That object is just an insanely beautiful artwork. And I I just think we are so lucky to have it. I just want to stare at it all the time. And I also want to know what real Nefertiti was like and I just want to talk to her and I bet she's so cool and like (laughs) badass and I just want to be in her presence (laughs) then number four I think I would have to pick Nadia Hussein who was a chef and she won um, a season of Great British Bake Off I think I definitely need a chef or a baker in the mix and she's just one of my favorite people she's like so sweet and she um, just brings me such joy she brings so much joy and happiness and I love that. I need more of that. And that would be really fun to have her at a dinner party. <laughs> she would be just like the freaking cutest. I know, I know. I know. I mean, like, Nadia, aggression. if you're listening to this, can we please? <laughs> I'm getting like cute aggression thinking about like Nadia hanging out with like Nemfordy. <laughs> oh like... my gosh. Two queens, truly. <laughs> Okay, and then I have to pick an artist, so I think I'm going to go with Louise Bourgeois. And she, Louise just seems like a party animal, and I really think that she would liven up the bunch, you know? She would freak everybody out. <laughs> I think that sounds so fun. I just want her to walk in with, like, the giant penis, you know? <laughs> well, no, that's what I was thinking about with Linda. She's just going to bring a, oh. all the dildos up in there and, like, call it a day. Linda and Louise, can we combine our two groups? I think that would really be a smash. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, Gianna, on that note, I am ready to talk about some ladies. So would you like to start us off with your first woman to celebrate on this lovely International Women's Day? (laughs) I would love nothing more. So my first pick for today is an artist I got to really focus on for an entire semester in college. And that is Halea J. Sanat Jenny. Sanat Jenny is an indigenous activist and artist who uses photography as a conceptual tool and an act of protest against the perception that Westerners have had on Native people. That has even more so been shaped with the invention of photography and the popularity and consuming indigenous images. Since its occurrence in the early 1800s, historic photographs taken of non-Native people have played a key role in constructing and perpetuating cultural stereotypes of Native people and Indigenous photographers like Sanat Jenny have also used this technology to depict a more truthful documentation of their culture and communities. So Sanat Jenny was born in Arizona. Her father was an artist and he actually studied at the Santa Fe Indian School. But she ended up doing her undergrad in art in California and was heavily influenced by her father's career. And that's where she really began to explore photography. And from what I know, she has done a lot of activist work for Native communities and people in the Bay Area. I think for Sanat Jenny, photography started as a tool to capture Native icon and activists but to also find an accessible way of documenting and educating people about Indigenous experiences and Indigenous sovereignty. As she partnered with and worked with nonprofit organizations that weren't just tribal specific, um, really allowed other people into the conversation and promoted the ability of Native people to thrive in urban environments. But then when she entered her master's program in the early 2000s, photography also became this very personal way of exploring her family history as well as indigenous iconography, altogether redefining what it means to be a Native American through these larger narratives that um, really transcended time. She was able to reclaim her Native identity within her work by taking her own pictures, manipulating them to look vintage, and adding in other mixed-media material through the method of collage. 
to stimulate conversation about the ethnographic gaze placed upon Native people, Sinat Jenny also physically sought out other problematic photographs of Native Americans, which were originally taken by white photographers in order to appropriate the vintage imagery and give it new meaning. With this process in mind, I want to specifically look at her piece, Oklahoma, the Unedited Version. At first glance, the viewer can see how multiple methods and materials are being used in this mixed media piece. Through the use of photo collage, early Native figurative imagery is being presented as two women in traditional Native attire ride on their horses. This is where the narrative becomes increasingly more interesting as we, the viewer, have to decipher what the setting is, as the landscape was intentionally cut out of the original photograph. When observing the background more intently, the lines, numbers, and roads reflect a map of central Oklahoma, but positioned in the middle ground is an old-fashioned television from which the female writers appear to be emerging from the screen. By forming this distinct composition, Sinat Jenny not only creates a sense of visual depth in this invented landscape, but she also utilizes the space to suggest the passage of time. These visual clues lead us to conclude that the repurposed vintage image serves as a platform to create a larger discussion about the representation of Indigenous people. By linking the past and the present, Sinat Jenny suggests that there is still a need to have a conversation centered on this continuous problem as she revives the image into a contemporary setting. When specifically relating this process, you know, just back to this specific image, Sinat Jenny has chosen to use this image so she can transport the Oklahoma women from their original context. In doing so, she fragments time by surrounding the Native writers in the new setting of the roadmap, which then is able to bring the figures into a modern context. Sanat Jenny speaks to this method as creating segmented moments in time in which the memory of the women will be brought back to life now from an indigenous understanding instead of a Western perspective. So when using this new lens to display this old image, Native audiences will be able to connect to this theme of reclamation, and non-Native audiences will be able to connect with the landscape as it encourages them to recognize the visual sovereignty at hand, but also allow for the exploration of personal history. Sanat Jenny herself is not from Oklahoma, but she does have a deep connection to the Oklahoma landscape from, you know, purely an individual perspective and just spending time here and traveling here with her mother. By creating this artistic piece and this visual documentation, Sanat Jenny is creating this conversation and is creating this inclusive environment by breaking down cultural barriers in order to connect with that larger audience, which is something she has proven to not only do in her work, but through her activism as well. Um, so I thought that was a fun piece to talk about because of the Oklahoma landscape, um, but she is really an incredible artist and activist and uh, teacher as well. Yeah, her work is stunning. And I also love what you were talking about in the context of her work where part of her goal is to bring conversations about Native American heritage into the urban landscape. And I love those conversations that she has about space. I think it's really beautiful. Yeah, and I think it'll be interesting as we progress, a lot of the artists that we're looking at today use photography, use language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit of that in, in all the artists that we talk about today in all of these works. and language and place identity is all so tightly rooted together and and that's all coming from this extremely personal place from all these artists so yeah I think that actually, leads us oh that was perfect Gianna ha 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 clever I'm girl for the next here. one <laughs> <laughs> oh I have been waiting to talk about this artist for a minute so my first pick of the day is Shirin Nishat Nishat is an artist that I just have admired for such a long time, but I was thinking about this when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to talk about in the concept, in the broader context of her work, because I actually haven't seen too much of her work in person. 
again, like Gianna was saying, much of what she's known for is photography and film. And I'm actually going to link in our show notes an interview that Nishat did with Katie Hessel on the Great Women Artists podcast, where she talks about this really interesting idea that when her filmic works are displayed in museums or galleries, many people actually don't have the opportunity to watch them in full because of the nature of those spaces. A lot of the times, it's not just possible to sit for 20 or 30 minutes kind of watching and taking in this film. People kind of glance, they'll maybe stay for a few minutes and sit, but a lot of the times you don't get to watch the whole thing whenever you're in a museum. So many of you listening might have had kind of the same experience that I've had with her work where you're watching it in an art class or at home instead of in that classic kind of art context. So definitely check out that Great Women Artists episode with her. It's an awesome conversation. Shirin Nishat is an Iranian-American artist who, again, primarily works in the photo and video realm. She was born in Iran in 1957, four years after the CIA-assisted coup that replaced Iran's first democratically elected government. She came from a very progressive family, but at the behest of her father, moved to the United States in 1975. She talks about how she felt very isolated when she moved to the States with the Iranian revolution underway back at home, and she wasn't able to return to Iran until 13 years later. During her time in America, she went to art school and then she moved to New York where she married, she had a child, and continued to promote and be a part of the contemporary art scene in Manhattan. But the 90s is really when Nashat became a big name in the art world. In 1990, she returned to Iran for the first time since the revolution and found that her home was greatly different from the westernized country from her upbringing. When she came back to the United States, she then produced her first acclaimed photographic series called The Women of Allah which are all black and white images of Nashat dressed in a chador. And by Islamic law, only her feet, her hands, and face can be exposed in this garb. The series contains a set of four symbols that are associated with Western representations of the Muslim world. And those are the veil, the gun, the text, and the gaze. And what we see in probably one of her most famous images of this series called Rebellious Silence is Nishat in a chador with her face exposed and the barrel of a gun is held right in the middle of her face, almost splitting the image in half. And this text is present throughout the series on the places where her body can be exposed. So again, that's her hands, her feet, and her face. These texts detail the feelings of female desires to fears of women's participation in militant efforts. Also, I just wanted to bring a side note in. If you like Sharin Nishat's work, you should also look at Lala Asayidi. She's an artist that I have come to know through my work. We had an exhibition on her. Um, She's a Moroccan photographer that plays a lot with text in a similar manner to Nashat, so I just wanted to highlight her as well. What I think the most common thread throughout Nashat's work is, is this idea of dichotomy. So she's working with both ideas and images of her personal visual culture that reveal such stark contrasts, East and West, men and women, public, private, masculine, feminine, modernity versus antiquity. And a smart history article reads that many of these symbols used in her work have taken on a particular charge since 9-11, even though a lot of her works were obviously created before 9-11. And in the interview I mentioned, Nishat also brings up this point of feeling isolated in both Iran and the U.S. as an immigrant. And while I'm talking about, you know, these themes found from her early bodies of work, she carries these parallels through our present day politics. And she's still making art, she's still very active, particularly in reference to xenophobia and immigration policy. And 
her films are really just so amazing so before i move on with gianna's next choice i do want all of you to watch her film fervor from 2000 that's probably the one that many of you if if you've taken an art class have probably seen but fervor is truly amazing it's really a fantastic piece to sit and watch and it exhibits all of those details all of those ideas of contrast so clearly so i i would definitely recommend that just to kind of recap your little synopsis there at the end in these photographs from this particular series that idea of just the isolation that she has captured mm -hmm. within these photographs is so interestingly portrayed as it's also just confrontational with those other conflicting symbols that are going on and you are also confronting her in especially this particular photo with the gaze um mm -hmm. yeah the gaze is, is a really great point Gianna. yeah all right well let's move on to artist number three shall we <laughs> <laughs> the next artist i would like to talk about is juliana huxtable because you know we stand a juliana on apt <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, but Juliana Huxtable was born intersex and grew up in a very uh, conservative Baptist home in Texas, uh, born in 1987. She attended Bard College in New York, where she studied art, gender studies, and human rights. In her work, Huxtable explores the intersections of race, gender, queerness, and identity. And she uses a diverse set of means to engage these issues, including self-portraiture, text, performance, and then talking about physical realities and digital realities. Huxtable, much like her concepts, her process is very fluid and experimental and also very vast. As she explores interdisciplinary practices from the visual and written and audible language and ways of communicating, where she critiques existing social norms while providing tr a, a truthful and a transparent and alternative and even hopeful possibilities at times. Mm. Not only is Huxable an artist, she is also a writer, a performer, she's a DJ, and she is a co-founder of the New York-based nightlife project Shock Value, which is a weekly New York City-based nightlife collective run by female creatives. Huxable's multidisciplinary art practice explores a number of concepts, ranging from the internet, the body, often through a process she calls conditioning, which I think is best explained as the exploration of self and imagination, whether through her literary works, her poems, or her visual images that can be contextualized within a historic past, a contemporary setting, and in future realities. Huxbull, being a woman and being born intersex, commonly inserts her body into multiple and highly saturated, photographed, and I would even say surrealist environments, where she commonly constructs human and animalistic hybrids that speak to the fluidity of gender and sexuality in creating these very digitally enhanced and stylized beings, or as I even saw them being described as avatars. With the merging of the two art forms, art and text, some of her works that visually read as or act like a graphic poster are really rooted in a larger history of protest and protest art. The process of writing, like some of the artists we're looking at today, I think is essential in how Huxtable explores the capabilities of the body that moves beyond how we see bodies interacting and behaving and existing and what is and isn't normalized. And I think th for Huxtable, there's something that language can do for her that not just a visual can. If you have listened to some of the conversations we have had on APT, we have talked about the aesthetics of different forms of protest and works of art attributed to different types of activism and how those aesthetics have come to be through collective movements and mobilizations. And listening to an interview with Huxtable that she did with Art Forum, she finds the history of the aesthetics of protest very interesting because in terms of her art and what she communicates about her experiences, she is continually challenging and exploring what, quote, radical protests look like, 
what a radical body looks like, perhaps. And this also lends itself very well to concepts of futurism and posthumanism. Other aspects of her work involve how we learn and how we absorb history, how that is manifested through cyberspace and the internet. And so there's this merging of cyber realities and history all kind of manifesting together in this fantasy-like setting where she casts herself in and she also creates for us. To kind of tie back into this idea of text, I wanted to end on a quote. Huxbull states, I wrote a lot of the texts that I've used in my art, but I also found a lot of texts that I repurpose, comments on YouTube, videos about the destruction of Black families, and a quote from conservatives' right-wing radio talking about the infiltration of trans people, for instance. That's one of the things that excites me about text. It's slippery, but you can try and condition the space in which that slippage occurs. I would like to think that my practice is about conditioning a productive space for thinking and processing. So you're getting spontaneous fragments and they're setting in different ways. Oh, wow. That's a really, really powerful quote. I think that's really cool. I also want to go to this collective that she um, runs yeah, in New York. It sounds cool I as shit. need to go ASAP. So it just, it looks really fun. Her work carries a lot of depth but I'm also just really attracted to it aesthetically I think there's something you were talking about post-humanism um a little bit Gianna and that that idea of avatar avatars is really interesting but mm -hmm. I think there's something almost related to the idea of well, that I think uncanny there... about this work as well well, I think in a lot of her work, there is that shock value to it. And I think that she explores the bodies in ways that people are afraid to. And she does that through perhaps confrontational topics. I mean, she definitely talks about subjects um, through her sexuality and she uses visuals that include things like bestiality into a conversation. But also we could talk about bestiality and how that plays into such a large history of art and um you know so using your body and politicizing your body is such a powerful thing yeah her work is just so saturated and beautiful and she does create these very um fantasized like environments and uh there's this one in particular that i'm looking at right now in front of me where she is standing on this leopard couch and when she talks about how she stylized some some of her images, this this stylization is very important because there's so many layers to her photographs. There's a lot of FX makeup going on, but there's also a lot of digital drawing on top of that as well. And it just makes me think of a lot of artists that I know right now that are exploring gender through this idea of skin and also trying to break down gender normative standards through external bodies. And I think she's doing a lot of that. Moving on, my next woman is someone that we have briefly mentioned on the show before. She's not necessarily an artist, but is a historical figure that we absolutely know from art history specifically. I am talking about Empress Theodora. There are some really cool art historical images of her, but the one that we see over and over again is her mosaic at the Basilica of San Vitale in Ravenna, Italy, that was made in 547 CE. Theodora was the wife of Emperor Justinian I, and in the basilica we get these two mosaic panels one featuring Justinian and the other featuring Theodora and her attendants. Theodora was most likely born in the year 500 in Crete or Syria and died in 548 in or around Constantinople. She was one of the most powerful women in Byzantine history. She was born into the lowest class of Byzantine society but eventually advanced to rule over the entire Byzantine Empire equally with her husband. She grew up on the outskirts of the Byzantine Empire with a father who was an animal trainer. After his death, 
Theodora became an actress to support the family. And during this time, the profession of being an actress was considered quite scandalous. Being an actress was synonymous with being a prostitute. And I believe that some scholars have argued that she could have been a prostitute. And I think this is sort of that similar idea that we see with, um, for example, the French ballet dancers in Impressionist works of the late 1800s, where they are working professionals, but are also known for kind of taking gentleman callers as well. So Theodora climbed these classist ranks of her society, and when she was 16, she discovered and adopted Christian ideology and converted and renounced her former career and lifestyle. Theodora met Justinian I in 522, who was, at that time, Justinian was heir to the throne. He wanted to wed her, but as heir, he was forbidden to marry someone of her status, let alone a woman of a performative profession, like being an actress despite her recent reformation. Justinian had this law repealed the following year, however, and the two were married in 525. Theodora and Justinian were known for ruling as intellectual and political equals, and Theodora was responsible for much of the reformation of Byzantium. She had a large role in erecting the basilica that I mentioned earlier, which again depicts both the emperor and the empress participating in an imperial procession. And this signifies her equal role and importance in ruling the empire. Also not to mention that they're displayed on the same level yes. in the same foreground because perspective is a super big thing, oh, even though yes, it's Jonah. not realistic. Um, but it's that visual hierarchy, and they're at the same level. Yeah, for sure. In 532, religious unrest unfolded and caused the famous Nika riots, which actually, Gianna, I know you have an episode in the works for Nika riots. <laughs> Basically, why we have sports is because of these riots. Literally versus, like, the Team Blue versus Team Orange. It's literally shit like that. That's why we have sports. You're welcome. <laughs> So expect an episode on Nika riots later on. As a result, much of Constantinople was destroyed, and many saw this as a chance to overthrow Justinian, who actually wished to flee the empire. Instead, badass queen Theodora was like, mm, no, we're not going to flee. And she preferred to die a ruler than to be removed from the revolt. Theodora and Justinian because of Theodora, confronted the destruction of important monuments in Constantinople, including the original Hagia Sophia, and the couple rebuilt the basilica, which was rededicated in 537. During her time as empress, Theodora also fought for the persecuted. She attended to the rights of prostitutes in particular by closing brothels, she created protective safe houses, and she passed laws to prohibit forced prostitution. In addition, she passed laws that expanded the rights of women in divorce cases, okay, and abolished a law that had allowed women to be killed for committing adultery. She also built houses of worship that served as places of refuge. Truly amazing. Theodora is also featured at a play setting in Judy Chicago's The Dinner Party, and a lot of the information I shared with you can be found through resources at the Sackler Center for Feminist Art on their website. Also, in 2013, Dolce & Gabbana released a line that references the golden mosaics of Sicily's Cathedral of Montreal as a starting point for their fall collection that year, but there are some specific visuals and comparisons to Theodora's mosaics that are stunning on these garments, and it's very kind of heavenly bodies, like Met Gala-esque, but we'll, we'll put some images on our Instagram and our resources page, but I just, I love this dress, this Dolce & Gabbana dress so much. It's, it's stunning, and the crown and the earrings, I just, it's so beautiful. Did nobody wear this outfit to the Met Gala? Like, what a missed opportunity. Yeah, but I think also, wait, no, because if I was going to the Met Gala, I would have someone else design me, like, a 
whole new Theodora wardrobe. Also, yeah, I guess. I mean, like, Heavenly Bodies, I think, is a little bit different than Theodora's garb. Yeah, you're the, right. the Dolce & Gabbana gowns reference, like, mosaics in the tesserae. Tesserae are little pieces mm-hmm. that make up the mosaic. Mm-hmm. And so I think they are specifically specifically referencing the craft of these mosaics so but i i see i see your point i just but think it's that still just so oh, like also to royal point... and ethereal <laughs> and fucking gorgeous and like she's wearing a goddamn crown no the models all of the models on the runway i think were wearing crowns but also gian i need to point out that this is dolce and gabbana's ready to wear a line for fall 2013 and i don't think that the celebs at the met gala would be like in ready to wear mm. dolce and gabbana <laughs> Yeah, hard pass. <laughs> yeah, same. I would totally like pass As out this As a celebrity gown. myself, yeah. <laughs> mm, I totally get that. <laughs> and is it just me or does P.A. Audrey Kaminsky have a Theodora dress that she wears sometimes? Because I feel like she has a dress with Empress Theodora on it. <gasps> no, it's not a dress. It's like a flowy shirt thing or maybe it is a long dress i know what you're talking about do you know what i'm talking about i know what you're talking about she (laughs) totally does we need to have her send us a picture so we can post it poor audrey she's gonna be like driving in the car listening to this like what do you want from me (laughs) (laughs) okay well i think we probably have time for one more lady today gianna what do you think oh yeah always always time for one more lady (laughs) (laughs) There's always room for more. <laughs> All right. Well, the last spectacular woman that I am talking about today is, again, one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> this is Megumi Igashari, or better known under the pseudonym Roku Danashiko. And this pseudonym is roughly translated to, quote, good for nothing in Japanese. Roku Danashiko is a Japanese sculptor and manga artist born in 1972 that considers it her mission to, quote, demystify female genitalia in Japan, where she believes that they are overly hidden in comparison to phallic imagery. She is known in Japan as the vagina artist. Love to see it. (laughs) Much of her work stems from her questioning the penis's privileged place in Japanese culture. In Japan, the Shinto Kanamara Matsuri, or Festival of the Steel Phallus, is held each spring in Kawasaki, Japan, and I really need to go. I know that it's problematic, but I really also want to go to this festival. (laughs) The phallus is the central theme of the event and is created in displays and illustrations. You can get candy, there are carved vegetables, there are decorations, and there's a parade all about the phallus. The Kanamara Matsari is centered on a local penis venerating shrine. The legend is that a jealous sharped tooth demon hid inside of the vagina of a young woman, vagina dentata-esque, if you will. If you want to listen to one of our Halloween episodes. Then, hmm, sounds familiar. (laughs) Sounds very familiar. (laughs) The demon fell in love with this woman and bit off penises of two young men on their wedding night. After that, the woman sought the help of a blacksmith who fashioned an iron phallus to break the demon's teeth which led to the enshrinement of the item. However, the artist Roku Danashiko experienced and responded to the taboo discussions and presentations of the vulva and female anatomy in response to the proud and celebrated depictions of the phallus. The goal of much of her work is to make the vagina more pop and free of stigma. This began with models made from molds of her own vagina or vulva. With these molds and digital recreations of them, Roku Danashiko made a vagina lampshade, a remote-controlled vagina car, different accessories, smartphone cases, chandeliers, dioramas, even a kayak that she dubbed Mango, the vagina boat, which acted (laughs) as a, quote, 
metaphorical image of life springing from it because she sits in the boat where her vagina is. <laughs> Two bass drums and a cymbal falling off a cliff. <laughs> After a successful crowdfunding campaign for the kayak project, the artist emailed her donor some data about her vulva as a funding gift in case they wanted to print their own vulva vehicles. Then in July of 2014, police came to her house and arrested her, citing her quote, obscene vagina boat. Though she was released from jail a week later, Later that same year, she was arrested again, this time over vulva sculptures that she'd exhibited in an adult store. She was found innocent of the displaying obscenities charge, but guilty of distributing obscenity on the grounds that she'd sent data to her crowdfunders and could supposedly sexually arouse them. She was also fined 400,000 yen. Yeah, it's wild. It's so wild. So she's also created a character called Manko-chan, which is translated to Miss Pussy, who mm -hmm. has been featured in manga and made into figurines, costumes, toys. Manko-chan is the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life. You can definitely find it pretty easily and purchase these kind of different kitschy items of the figure. In response to much of her legal battles, she continued to question Japan's definition of obscenity with the publication of her book in 2016 called What is Obscenity? The Story of a Good-for-Nothing Artist and Her Pussy. And the book seeks to make the vagina cute and explores the discrimination and taboo surrounding female genitalia. Um, you can find the adorable Mako-chan in the book as well, and it's it's also pretty accessible to find. You guys should be able to to find and purchase it pretty easily. Mm -hmm. I think that's a a really clever way of of going about getting her art across and her point across in a way that is so uh, in tune to Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. um, it's extremely hard to see a female artist go through some of the obstacles that she has had to go through, but respect her all the more for it and keeping with it and yeah i'm just obsessed with all the vagina content oh i know it's so cute i'm looking at mango chan right now and she's just adorable i just want to like hug her she's so cute yeah i want to see this next to like a judy goddess figure and i want them oh, to hang out yeah. at their own dinner party <laughs> for international women's day all of the art of vulvas just needs to come to maybe we could curate that exhibition i literally have sitting above me on my shelf as we speak an aluminum casted vulva that has a very decorative floral pattern to it just like Menko chan does and i think they need to hang out oh i agree <laughs> it's like we're playing with toys like i'm imagining like like a grown-up version of toy story where there's all these like <laughs> vulva toys that are like <laughs> adult toys. It's all these adult toys. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Well, on that note, I, <laughs> I think it's time for us to get out of here. I gotta oh, start man. packing, Gianna. I gotta start packing for my trip to Oklahoma. You you do indeed. I'm so excited to see you. So excited to celebrate this month with you. And I just want to say thank you to all of our APT women who support us. We love you and we support you and all of the women in our lives that we love. Oh my gosh, Gianna, that's so nice. Happy, I know, right? Happy <laughs> Women's History Month, everybody. It's, it's basically all year round, but it does feel extra special. And just a reminder, since I will be traveling to Oklahoma for spring break, there will be no new APT episode next week because Gianna and I will actually be spending the time together and it's going to be really nice just to enjoy some family time, but Gianna and I are going to record IRL. So the next time that you'll hear from us is going to be two weeks from now and we will be talking about 
one division with boy of apt andrew james so i hope that all of you also have a very happy spring break and get a little bit of time to yourself get caught up on wandavision before the next episode all right everyone we will talk to you in two tuesdays bye everyone art pop talks production assistant is audrey kaminsky music and sounds by josh turner Photography is by Adrian Turner, and our graphic designer is Sid Hammond.